Cryptocurrency has skyrocketed in popularity, but it's the blockchain that is seeing the most dramatic growth with far-reaching applications across many industries. From specialized payments to data storage solutions, blockchain is quickly becoming the go-to solution for a vast array of companies from financial institutions to gaming. This is great news for investors. Hello, I'm Bob Lang and welcome to the evolution of blockchain, how the foundation of crypto is changing fintech. Joining our panel today, Cal Eliashev, founder and managing partner, Spice Venture Capital. Ed Lopez, managing director and head of ETF products at VanEck. Matthew Siegel, head of digital assets research at VanEck. And Zeb Fima, research analyst, Action Alerts Plus. Ed, what are the biggest trends we are seeing today with blockchain? What companies out there are the most attractive from an investing view? Well, you know, let me start out with a, a quick example, some some just amazing stats to kind of frame it, and then we'll talk about the blockchain a little bit. But something that some people may not realize, um, just in terms of the number of users, to give some perspective of the demand by consumers today. So, for instance, uh, let's just look at uh, at a brokerage account. Um, E-Trade, for instance, has 5 million users. Schwab has 32 million users. Coinbase has 56 million users. Verified users. That's wow. that's just astounding. That's amazing. What that tells me is not only are people interested in just trading cryptocurrencies, but the 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 consumer set, the generation of people. It's a new generation of consumers. There's a new generation of tech and a new generation of solutions that are being worked on. Um, you know, I think we're still in the early stages of all of this and the potential for blockchain just broadly to uh, redefine business and um, you know the way that we do business, uh, but it's it's helping to uh, recreate the the financial system, and that's where Vanek kind of comes in, and where we're really interested in is making sure that we're staying ahead of potential disruptive uh, technologies. Um, you know, I think one of the biggest um, trends in the space, in particular in the in the financial industry right now, is DeFi, decentralized finance. Uh, that has the, uh, I guess, the potential to, again, I'm going to say it over and over again, probably recreate the financial system. There are projects uh, that are looking to do, um, that are focused on lending, uh, companies like BlockFi, Compound, Ava. Um, there's asset management companies that are, are strictly focused on on crypto or supporting crypto, whether through funds or, or mining themselves, but also providing the backbone infrastructure for the coming future of finance. And, and a company like Silvergate plays right into that and they're a public company. Um, and you're, you're seeing uh, the new evolution of exchanges, um, decentralized exchanges like Uniswap, which basically you know, it, through its automated market maker technology uh, effectively you know, functions as a secondary market, but you know, without all the middlemen, without uh, the market makers or the clearing houses or the custodians or, you know, all the financial institutions. And, and I think the potential of something like that to, to help lower costs and increase efficiencies are extremely attractive and have to be paid attention to. Um, and then I know, in, you know, in the news, we hear things about uh, some real buzzy things like NFTs. And there have been some some crazy things going on in the NFT space with some digital art and what have you. Uh, whether or not those stay around in that same form, I think that there's some technology uh, that's really coming out of that uh, to allow real world assets, uh, you know, whether it's collectibles or property rights, uh, you know, be transformed into crypto compatible assets, something that provides uh, liquidity and transparency um, and really more ease of ease of access. Seems to, seems to me, uh, Ed, that uh, that decentralization is probably a critical part of opening up access to others, not just from an investing standpoint, but for usage standpoint. Is that right? Yeah, I, th I think it, it, it is. I think we can have a system that is decentralized, that is secure, that can now be verified in a decentralized way uh, without the need for one central uh, intermediary or without, with, without several intermediaries, which... Um, are, which can be inefficient and more costly. Hmm, interesting. Hey, Matthew, I got a question for you here. What are the biggest challenges? And is the US falling behind in blockchain and crypto innovation when they could be easily be leading it? What countries generally have the biggest head start right now and are worth following? Bob, yeah, we, we agree the, the, the one of the biggest risks to wider um, adoption of this ecosystem is the regulatory backdrop. 
historically, America has had a first do no harm type of approach to new technologies. And, and that's meant that we've taken a leadership role uh, simply by letting the market do its trick. Uh, you know, that was true from the transistor to the early days of the internet to the genomics revolution, which is changing how consumers uh, consume healthcare. And now we have this new network technology, which returns the internet to its decentralized roots. Uh, in our view, it has positive implications for GDP, consumer welfare, the prices that people pay for goods and services. Uh, it may take power away from big banks and big tech and, and return it to the people. And instead of leading on that, the U.S. is letting our neighbors, Brazil and Mexico, lead the way on ETF adoption by approving these instruments. Um, the rest of the country seems to be moving faster ahead while the U.S. sits on its hands and from our perspective, uh, that's unfortunate. It's, it's really a, a strange twist of fate that reflects just how politicized uh, this issue has become. You know, in the long run, we think the truth will, will win out. Uh, the blockchain just has too many advantages when it comes to efficiency and cost and unlocking demand that really we didn't know we had for transferring value across the internet globally. 365, 24-7. So it, it's not too late for the U.S. There's a lot of innovation that is happening um, in Silicon Valley and funded by American venture capitalists. But uh, we do need some regulatory clarity in order to bring the this technology to the next level. It, it's pretty understandable that the um, country U.S. would be dragging their feet because it always seems to be slow to respond to new technologies here. But um, it 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 appears to me that, you know, being late to the party in this thing, it's not going to be a bad thing, but it's not going to be the best thing either. Would you agree with that? Well, I mean, I, I, I would kind of disagree with, with the premise that of, of, of your statement that historically we don't lead on new technologies. Um, U.S. has been, uh, you know, ahead of the pack on, on most innovation. Uh, that's because we have a, a setup in this country which lets new products and services develop without kind of intrusive government meddling. You know, this is a, um, a maybe a, a bit more scary technology because by definition, it, it takes some of the power away from those existing institutions that we've come to, to trust uh, over the decades. Uh, but uh, in the long run, the innovation which this technology unlocks by really letting every individual participate uh, without the permission of uh, large institutions uh, should increase financial inclusion and unlock demand for new financial transactions that previously didn't exist. So uh, it's not too late for the U.S. to take a leadership role. We have plenty of companies that are uh, doing great work. Coinbase would be a great example. It's the largest crypto exchange in the world, but it's it's only a 12% market share. So it's a very fragmented market. Uh, it's, it's too early to say who the eventual winners and losers will be. And we're just hopeful that, um, you know, the regulators and the public can, um, become more educated about how this technology will empower them to make more money. Uh, this is true when it comes to uh, crypto, and the U.S. is definitely lagging behind in terms of crypto regulations, and hopefully this will change over the next year with the new administration. But uh, the U.S. has been leading the pack in terms of uh, regulation related to blockchain in capital markets. Uh, and so in the whole uh, domain of digital securities, which are basically securities that are based on blockchain technology, uh, U.S. Uh, and the SEC have been leading the pack and uh, way ahead of uh, any other country. And the result of that was significant growth in the U.S. Uh, in uh, ventures and capabilities using blockchain in capital markets uh, versus in, uh, in other countries. So it just proves uh, what, uh, uh, what Matthew was saying, uh, regulations enable the growth of this, uh, of this market and the growth of, uh, of the technology supporting it. It's important to say first that uh, you know, people think about blockchain as a technology. Blockchain is really a set of concepts around uh, a distributed ledger and how it's, uh, it's used. And it grew out of crypto because this is this is the the first use case that kind of uh, created the necessity and brought uh, blockchain to our collective radar, starting with maybe Bitcoin a little bit more than 10 years ago. And other 
industries started understanding the, the capabilities and the potential value of using blockchain and the ability of these concepts to significantly change the way business is done in different industries um, only maybe three, four years ago. So in other industries, uh, the process is much younger than with crypto. And the result of that is that uh, each one of those industries, anywhere from, uh, and financials were probably in one of the first um, kind of industries to discover this, uh, anywhere from uh, banking, capital markets, payments, credit, uh, insurance, all these have their own um, purpose of using blockchain technology and blockchain technology is solving different problems in each one of those verticals. Um, and each one of those verticals is subject to different regulatory frameworks and different constraints and so on. So it, um, it challenges the concepts in a different way. And the result of that is different blockchains and different answers get developed in each one of those verticals. So just as, as two examples, if you look at payments versus uh, capital markets or the securities uh, industry, they have a lot in common in terms of scale and the need for speed of processing of transactions and so on. But payment transactions are a hell of a lot simpler uh, than securities transactions and a hell of a lot simpler to settle and, and so on. Um, and so the, the onus on, on blockchain technology in the securities industry is very different. Uh, and this leads to different protocols and different blockchains to, uh, to evolve. Long story short, um, it makes sense that there is not a single standard and there will not be a single standard. I think we will end up with maybe two or three different um, uh, blockchains or distributed ledger types in each one of the verticals. Um, and as industries start uh, maturing with the use of blockchain um, and evolving the solutions for each industry, we'll start seeing interoperability coming to play and common protocols for interoperability coming to play. We're probably, I don't know, three, five years from that in the financial domain and much more than that in other industries like telcos or healthcare, uh, but it will be coming. Yeah, I think the concerns around uh, a lack of interoperability are, are a bit of a false flag by, by the bears. It, it may be difficult to link various blockchains together. But when you're talking about the open source platforms that uh, underpin many of the larger and more liquid cryptocurrencies, these are open source projects. Anyone can write code to these. Any, anyone can theoretically make them operable with another blockchain. And that is more of an opportunity than a threat. It may mean uh, that um, early interoperability uh, mechanics are, are more complex or that the benefits accrue to those who write the code earlier. But just in the last year, we've seen um, a, a large number of, of so-called layer two networks that help the layer one networks like Bitcoin and Ethereum scale. Um, and there's millions of transactions taking place on these layer two networks right now. And uh, those are scaling as we speak. So, you know, the, there are several different blockchains that can enable these peer-to-peer -peer microtransactions without a centralized intermediary taking 10 to 30 percent of the cut like we see with Google and uh, Booking.com and, and Spotify. Um, so uh, with Ethereum transactions taking place at, at 50 basis points, uh, there's a lot of room to add some additional functionality, even if uh, it's charged for, and still end up with a solution that is much cheaper than uh, the status quo. So uh, I think we're making progress on that interoperability question. Uh, I agree with uh, Tal that uh, we don't know yet uh, necessarily who the winners are going to be. Uh, but because this is open source code and anyone can write uh, their own solutions, uh, I, I see the uh, interoperability question as, as more of an opportunity than, uh, than a headwind. Many of the implementations of blockchain technology are kind of deep, deep uh, under the hood and will not require interoperability in the way we think about it. So just as an example, HSBC just moved last year $20 billion worth of uh, 
private offering securities that it's holding in custody for its uh, clients, it moved them to the blockchain. And the reason is uh, it was much easier for them to manage ownership and settle transactions using blockchain. Now, there is no interoperability question here right now because they're doing it for internal purposes and for efficiency purposes. Um, later on, as more of the industry adopts these, you start talking about interoperability of doing settlements between institutions and so on, um, but the time will come for that. For now, it's not a hurdle for anything. So we have some indirect exposure through a few of our holdings. Um, we're invested in NVIDIA. They have an Ethereum mining chip. We're invested in PayPal. They they have, you know, buy, hold, sell Bitcoin. But the thesis on both of those companies, for example, is really not um, based on them, you know, working within the crypto ecosystem, whether it's Bitcoin or Ethereum. We kind of look at it more as, um, call it an embedded call option on the companies. Um, essentially, you know, we're tracking what's going on in blockchain with the different cryptocurrencies, you know, everything that, the, the previous speakers, Tal and Matthew, have, have, have said, um, I feel, I, you know, I, I agree with that. There's there's clearly a lot of value in blockchain, what what that application will be and how, and how long until, you know, companies really implement it and what kind of value they can unlock. I think that still remains to be the question in addition to, you know, which ones will win out. It's still sort of, I think, speculative. You know, when I, when I look at the different coins and, and everything out there, I think you have to approach it with something of a, a venture capital mindset. So it's not really appropriate for us in terms of if we wanted to take a more um, direct investment approach, whether it would be to buy cryptocurrencies or buy something like a miner um, that, that or a company that's taking on debt to buy more cryptocurrency or something like that. It's just it's it's too speculative for us. You know what that means for the individual investor. Um, it's really a, a risk reward question, I think. You know, I'm not going to say that there's there's no room for it, but I do think it should be approached um as you would any other sort of, uh, if we're talking equities, any other speculative equi equity, you know, maybe an early stage um, biotech, because because there's something there. But again, we don't know who the who the winner is, is necessarily going to be in terms of the value of a coin. You know, that remains to be seen. I think that'll probably end up being dictated by by how much value there is to being able to operate on the Ethereum blockchain, for example, based on the applications built on top of it. But as we sit here today, you know, that's a huge question mark. Um, and while we do acknowledge that there is value to blockchain in, in terms of, of gaining exposure to it, it, it's a little too speculative for us um, at Action Alerts Plus. I mean, that said, personally, I do own a little bit of Bitcoin, a little bit of Ethereum, but again, it's it's sized as a speculative position. Uh, it's because you're one of those millennials. That, that's why everybody, every millennial has got to have some Ethereum or Bitcoin in our portfolio, right? Hey, listen, if this if, if Bitcoin is going to be the digital gold, you know, the, the way which the way I've looked at it as, as far as the 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 current tax status, I don't really look at it as um, a currency. I'm, I'm not interested in going to the deli and being hit with the capital gains tax when I spend my Bitcoin. But so the way I look at it is, you know, what's the market cap on gold, whatever it is today, call it 10 trillion or something like that. What's the market coin uh, market cap on Bitcoin and figure, listen, if it does have uh, the potential to, you know, take half of that gold market cap. Um, it is a massive opportunity. Um, but again, that that remains to be seen. We have to see what's going on with the regulatory front. And I have some concerns on the, the market structure, which would not impact the thesis behind something like a Bitcoin, but I think it could impact the price. Um, there's a lot of leverage. There's it, the some of the exchanges could be a little bit more regulated, I think. Um, but that, that's kind of how we're, how I'm looking at it personally and then how we look at it for Action Alerts Plus. Zeb, I love your gold analogy, but I, I would take issue a little bit with the comment that uh, Ethereum, for example, uh, can't be modeled based on on their revenues. Um, you know, we estimate there's going to be more than $4 trillion worth of value transacted across the Ethereum network this year. Uh, we can track uh, the revenues of that protocol in real time because the network is paying out rewards to, to miners and, and validators who are helping preserve and, and validate the integrity of that blockchain. And, and that should generate, you know, up to $18 billion uh, in top line for the Ethereum network this year, most of which just flows through to the network participants in the form of new Ethereum coins. So it, it's true that that creates a well, lot of leverage because the revenues are denominated in Ethereum. So, you know, when the price is rising, you get this double barreled 
uh, tailwind and, and the reverse, unfortunately, would also be true uh, in a bear market. But uh, we'd argue that, that you can value this, that uh, the economics are, are very attractive because of the low cost base, the decentralized cost base. Every participant is contributing uh, their own compute power and time to this network. Uh, and, and that's part of, uh, of what makes it a very, you know, potentially very attractive valuation. And if you look at the multiple of the market cap of Ethereum to the revenues generated by these transaction fees, essentially, uh, it, it looks reasonably priced, uh, certainly not very expensive relative to, say, uh, Web 2.0 companies whose profits may potentially come under attack over the long run. So I, I look, I hear what you're saying about their sales based on the Ethereum network. But the reality is when I own an Ethereum coin, I don't have any con- it's not it's not like an equity position. I don't have control over the sales. If there, there's anything falls to the bottom line, I don't have um, any rights to those earnings. You know, I'm not getting paid out dividends or anything if I don't want to enter a yield program, which brings on its own borrower credit risk and is, is not you know insured in the same way or collateralized in the same way as a stock lending program. Um, so while I understand that there are sales and that there's money being generated through the ecosystem. The, the problem what, what, that I have with, with valuing it is me owning that one coin doesn't necessarily give me any type of ownership rights to the coin. I can't say, oh, Ethereum, you know, it, is it based on this price to sales and what are the margins going to be? And eventually, do I have some type of um, asset that's producing returns for me? You know, and what it really just comes down to is, will this coin go up in price? And, you know, can I flip it to somebody else if I ever want to lock in a profit? It's, it's something in my mind of, of the greater fool theory and, you know, which is fine. I mean, some people do, you know, buy high and sell higher. Um, But in terms of trying to value this on any traditional metric, I mean, you're not going to have price to earnings multiples, price to sales. You're not going to be able to look at gross margin. So, you know, again, I I hear what you're saying. And ultimately, I think it will come down to how much value can they generate, you know, in in your ability to um, participate or, or, or interact with the Ethereum blockchain. But I don't know that we can say, you know, that we can value an Ethereum coin just because of the sales that that transact that, that go through the blockchain. I'd like to pretty much Good. agree with Zev a little bit and, and on his perspective. I appreciate his perspective in, in terms of looking at and breaking and, and, and creating a difference between the currencies or those projects and the equities of, of companies. You know, from my perspective as an ETF product issuer, somebody that develops in, investable ideas for people. You know, we we created a, a portfolio that invests in the equity of companies that are involved in the in the digital asset ecosystem. Tal, let me ask you this: uh, How will implementing reporting, record keeping, and verification requirements on banks and money services affect digital currency transactions and investment? So, I think it's going to do a lot of good to uh, to this domain uh, for many reasons. I think the the first one uh, is quite obvious. Uh, a lot of people are concerned. Uh, getting involved with cryptocurrencies because of all the fraud uh, and uh, and security issues related to that. Um, a lot of this will go away when, uh, if and when cryptocurrencies get uh, kind of into this world garden of all financial uh, instruments with KYC, AML, accreditation when necessary, uh, and uh, basically identity behind all transactions. I think initially it, it will have uh, um, a short term, uh, maybe negative impact um, because it will complicate the life of DeFi products and so on. Uh, but in essence, it will make it a much safer place, not from a, a risk and volatility standpoint, but in terms of uh, fraud potential and so on, much safer place for most people. So that's one thing. And the second thing is it will make it much more palatable for institutional money to be involved. I mean, there is a lot of institutional money already moving into uh, crypto a lot because of, you know, people are interested in that exposure, but it will make it much easier for um, larger institutional involvement in that domain when um, identity uh, and um uh, safety and security is much more clear uh, and regulated uh, around that. Tal, I'm going to follow up with one more on you. With you, uh, the biggest benefit of blockchain seems to be security, and that is improving constantly. Yet the government is slow to adopt a standard, which we talked about earlier, of cryptocurrency, and thus blockchain may not be a focal point. 
Tal, is this a hindrance to the gr tremendous growth prospects that we see in, in blockchain and cryptocurrency? And what can be done to create even more awareness? When it comes to cryptocurrencies uh, specifically, I think it is a hindrance. Uh, and uh, it, it has not uh, stopped cryptocurrencies growth so far, but it will if it will not change, because I think it will get to a, a ceiling, a glass ceiling that will um, kind of slow down the growth if uh, if these uh, uh, standards uh, are not set. Uh, we talked about taxation. We talked about uh, clear regulations around uh, um, institutions uh, involved with cryptocurrencies and so on. It's really important that these get regulated um, and it will allow this market to grow um, much, much more uh, uh, fluidly. But I think if you look at other implementations of blockchain, um, the issue has not been security, actually. Um, we, uh, we see in other uh, verticals than, uh, uh, than cryptocurrencies um, other attributes of blockchain that add significant value. So, for example, we I think we, we mentioned before that uh, one of the attributes of blockchain is immutability of the network. So uh, transactions never go away, they can't be changed, uh, and so on. And that has uh, significant value for many uh, industries. Um, um, it makes sharing data and trust uh, much easier. And um, many transactional industries are spending a tremendous amount of effort around making sure that ledgers of different uh, companies involved in a transaction kind of sync and match uh, and so on. Uh, and a lot of uh, management layers for approval, uh, audits and so on. This is why a payment transaction that uh, from a technology standpoint can take uh, a minuscule fraction of a second can take two, three days in the real world. Um, and all this can go away using blockchain technology. And the impetus for this is not, uh, is not diminished because of uh, lack of regulations we, that we talked about before. And uh, it's been, uh, blockchain has been adopted like crazy uh, under the hood in most financial industries. There is almost no large bank or financial institutions that is not involved in uh, blockchain projects in different verticals or investing in this technology or developing the capability internally. Um, and this has not slowed down. If at all, um, it, is, uh, uh, it is exploding. Uh, and as a, as a VC, I mean, these are the, the type of companies that enable this are the companies that we, uh, we invest in. Uh, so we see it very, very, very closely. How much progress is still needed on regulatory clarity around crypto assets? And how hard is it, given the novelty of some of the potential actions and consequences? Well, let, let me start with some of the regulatory successes. Uh, I think if the colonial pipeline hack and, and subsequent recovery of all that Bitcoin proved anything, it, it, it was that uh, this technology um, you know, can be monitored by a motivated government when there is clear evidence of infraction. And the private sector has built up uh, a number of analytical tools that will help identify dirty Bitcoin. Uh, so there's been lots of data which shows the percentage of illicit transactions on the blockchain is lower than what happens in a cash-based society. And we're hopeful that, uh, you know, the government is going to look at this as um, a tool to find bad actors uh, and not, uh, you know, a enabler of a disproportionate amount of, of bad actors. Um, so that would be one point. What, in your mind, is your uh, best guess is the Fed, Federal Reserve, afraid of with cryptocurrency? Yeah, well, I mean, they're lo they're afraid of losing their monopoly over the manufacturing of, of money, right? Because these are uh, decentralized communities that have their own economies denominated in money that is not backed by the full faith and credit of the United States. So they are truly bottoms up uh, network effect economies. Uh, and uh, they are um, equalizing 
uh, in a great sense uh, geopolitically. And that's why you see that some of the countries that are on the fringes of our financial system, who have loans uh, from the IMF that are in danger of default, uh, like El Salvador, uh, are increasingly looking at cryptocurrencies as a way around that kind of yoke of dollar colonialism, which has been uh, tethering them uh, for decades. I'm talking about Latin America in this case. So, um, you know, it's not surprising to see the powers that be uh, a little jittery about uh, this new technology. But uh, as the benefits become clear and financial inclusion uh, increases, uh, the uh, the ship has sailed on that front. So t to answer your specific question, I think the Fed is, uh, is in uh, listening mode. Uh, uh, they haven't said much, uh, and you know the rest of us are 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 going to are going to wait and see what guidance comes out. But the rest of the world is not waiting on the Fed. Uh, the rest of the world is seeing value in uh, a second source of monetary um, uh, sovereignty, really that that disintermediates the Fed, and um, you know we'll we'll see how that shakes out. China is uh, is leading. Uh, is leading the way in terms of digital currency. We're not talking about uh, cryptocurrency like Bitcoin. They're going exactly the opposite direction. Uh, but we're talking about a digital yuan. And this is where the central bank really realizing that a digital currency um, gives uh, central bank and gives the government much more control over uh, transactions, much more control over the use of money, um, and being able to identify illicit transactions and so on in a much better way. And this is why uh, China is pushing it so aggressively uh, and are truly leading the, the world in that sense. I think Europe is uh, somewhere behind and the U.S. here is totally lagging because we're just beginning to talk now about uh, uh, the possibility of doing this in the future. It's just kind of talks about talks about uh, digital currency, which is kind of interesting. How has Bitcoin mining equipment and technology, Ed, evolved? And what does that mean for investors looking to get into the cryptocurrency market? What should investors know? Well, the, uh, the mining industry has, has evolved uh, dramatically. It used to be where you could just download a node on your computer and do mining on your PC. Uh, but with the growth of the network and uh, the increase in usage, uh, the computing power required to, to solve the cryptographic problems has, has increased dramatically. People moved from uh, the CPU power to GPU, graphics processing units, in, in 2010, because it's more powerful, can do multiple math uh, calculations at once instead of uh, consensually. That moved on to uh, an even more powerful um, type of uh, processing unit. And past that, uh, in 2013, we saw the, uh, the ASICs units now, which are application-specific integrated circuits. These are dedicated um, processors, dedicated machines that uh, incorporate both the hardware and the software uh, components necessary to, to, to do these uh, complicated calculations. And to kind of give you a sense of how much more powerful they are, an ASICs machine is... Uh, 100 billion times the speed of the average CPU back in 2009, uh, which just is, is amazing. And it's also amazing to think that's not just one unit now that has evolved. You have companies that have, have evolved out of this space that have data warehouses full of these units. And it's, it's become a legitimate business, particularly as the price of cryptocurrencies and, and Bitcoin in particular has, has risen. Uh, it has given them the ability to be profitable. Um, and so now there are these these businesses, and I, we will end up talking more about how they operate and, and they, they're, they're flexible in terms of where they can locate, things of that sort. Um, but what, what we have now is that the current state, I believe, of the, of the mining industry is that it's evolved to a certain point where you have this uh, great computing power, but the increases in computing power are diminishing. Uh, so now miners are going to have to focus on other areas of their business to generate that profit. In the past, it was get the best, fastest uh, processor to you know to be able to do that calculation and earn some Bitcoin. Now they're going to have to pay more attention to 
um, their energy costs, financial planning, and perhaps diversification of their business. It seems like there's so much, um, uh, a, a lot of lack of understanding uh, that we can actually ban Bitcoin mining because it takes up too much electricity. And I just want to point out that uh, it's a very tiny percentage of global energy which is actually electrified. So even if you told these Bitcoin miners that they can't use electricity anymore, they can just go and tap into the other 80% of global energy that uh, is not hooked up to the electrical grid. And, and that's why within just a few weeks of China uh, reportedly cracking down on Bitcoin mining because of environmental concerns, we're seeing publicly traded mining companies striking deals in Argentina, in Canada, in Texas to redeploy that capacity. And that's because there's always going to be a local government or a local power company uh, who has too much energy and is looking to sell it to uh, some source of flexible demand, right? So you can't uproot an iron ore mine, you can't move a copper refinery, but a Bitcoin mine can go anywhere in the world where there is uh, stranded energy and instantly monetize it to be spent on uh, public welfare. Uh, so surely Bitcoin mining is, uh, is changing, uh, but um, it's, very flexibility uh, supports the strength of the network and will turbocharge the adoption of renewable power as these Bitcoin miners search out the lowest cost sources of that renewable power. So I just thought that was an important uh, point to make. Because the underlying blockchain record is immutable, NFTs allow sellers to verify digital assets authenticity. When you buy an NFT, of course, that transaction is added to the blockchain ledger and becomes a verifiable record of ownership. Does this essentially demonstrate that you can have a digital economy with digital property rights? We've seen $2 billion worth of NFTs sold in the first quarter alone, and that was on an Ethereum network that was clogged with very high transaction costs. Um, you know, it would be a, a akin to trying to stream Netflix on your dial-up AOL connection of the mid-1990s. So these were really just a proof of use case. And as Ethereum 2.0 rolls out later this year, new pricing model for how transaction fees will be calculated, uh, capacity on the network is going to grow a lot. You know, I'm going to make a bold call and say that number is going to be 10x next year. We're going to see uh, a lot more virtual items coming out of the creator economy. Uh, we saw a, a, a virtual Gucci bag that was sold on Roblox uh, last week for $4,000, which is more than what you pay for an actual Gucci bag. Now, Roblox takes 80% of these transactions, 70 to 80% of those transactions. Ethereum is going to take 50 basis points. Who do you think is going to take market share? I'm going to bet on Ethereum. You're going to blow your mind with another concept, and that's the metaverse. And, you know, video games you know, have these skins that you can buy and, and use for your character and and uh, blockchain and, and crypto plays right into that. But what's happening is a kind of a demographic shift for how people consume things, how they consume entertainment and physical goods. Where we're going right now is this idea of the metaverse. It's almost like the Matrix, if you remember that movie, <laughs> where... You're going to have digital art. You're going to have um, tokens that you use to, uh, you know, play and buy skins on your video games. You're going to use a video game to access digital concerts and different venues. And uh, there's going to be a whole nother kind of world uh, in a digital world where digital natives, uh, a younger generation uh, that are coming up that are uh, participating in today and and, and they, they are used to today, but it's going to develop even even further and I think blockchain technology plays right into that. Uh, kind of on the NFT front, I know we've talked a little bit about some of the digital aspects of NFTs and some of the cool ideas of NFTs. I, one of the areas in this space which really kind of gets me excited is bringing the real world assets into the crypto landscape, making things like real estate or patents uh, more accessible, uh, more liquid and um, and, and so to me, that's a, that's a fascinating uh, area to, to, to think about. Um, you know, as somebody that, that invests in real estate, the idea of, you know, not having to deal with a title company, not having to deal with an inspector or all these other intermediaries, um, totally lowers the costs of, of that type of transaction. And I think you'll see some of that in, in other industries as well. By, by the way, because I mentioned the metaverse, um, 
Any, that that is certainly what the companies are looking at. If you read the, the first quarter earnings call from um, Unity, they they take a, a little bit of time to explain what they see in the metaverse. Um, and I might offer up, you know, the the, the world you're describing yet probably it, it sounds a lot more like Ready Player One maybe um, than the Matrix. And it, and if the idea is that NFTs could be tied to these digital assets like you see in that movie, um, I certainly think um, it's going to be very interesting in, in terms of digital ownership. But you know, the, the same way we're, we're looking at, at, at cryptocurrencies, I still think it's, it's very early days with NFTs and a lot of the money being spent there. You know, I, I, I still I, I'm, I'm sort of in the camp that there's absolutely value in NFTs. You know, Ed had mentioned a few different ways to you know, type, not go through title ownership and stuff, and it can be tied to physical assets. But at the same time, um, there's a lot of speculation out there. Um, and, and I think that's just kind of the market we're in. I mean, we, someone sold an invisible statue basically not a statue for, for $18,000. So I think the, the technology is there on NFTs, but maybe what some people are, are spending on these things lately um, is a little bit more you know, speculative. So as we wrap things up, what uh, is the next trend or company to watch for in the blockchain space? Well, I, I would say the, the next uh, product release from Ethereum uh, is really the one to watch. Um, you know, market participants are, are focused on this Ethereum 2.0, which really has kind of started its rollout already. We'll take another big step in July. Uh, theoretically, the capacity on that network should grow, you know, by 50x and costs should come down by 95 percent. And that should unleash, you know, a whole lot of applications that you know didn't make a ton of economic sense uh, at the beginning of this year such as nfts and and gaming uh, so we're looking to see how much latent demand is there on that network and and can they fill it uh, when network capacity increases uh, my guess would be yes but we'll have to wait and see I, I think there's a number of players there and then there uh, uh, is a, we have a portfolio of them in, in one of our etfs you know Top of mind for me right now is seeing how the whole ESG discussion plays out in the mining space and and helping uh, frame uh, the right perspective uh, with regards to to that and how miners can actually uh, help incentivize renewable energy um, and renewable energy development. So I uh, that's that's an area that I, that I'm watching. Uh, I, I like looking at the miners right now, um, kind of given the level of of crypto assets. And you know the uh, the state of play, if you will, uh, and momentum that we have towards more renewable sources of energy. As far as a company in the blockchain space, um, like I'm, a, I'm a simple equities analyst. I, I certainly can't speak to the projects the way Tal and Matt can. Um, but I would say what I'm watching is really re regulation um, for increased transparency in the space. And then again, I'm, I'm somewhat concerned over these stable coins, um, as a lot of these are offshore entities, they're, they're, they're pretty much unregulated. Um, and the stable coins are a huge piece of the, the liquidity in the market. You know, it's not as, as big as some say, but it, it seems to be the, the largest single piece um, is tied to certain stable coins. And then they're used as collateral for this highly leveraged market. So uh, what, I'm, what I'm looking for is regulation. I don't know that I'm looking at it as a good or bad thing because I think regulation can also draw in more participants. Um, I want to see, you know, increased transparency on things like, st especially the stable coins that claim to be backed by assets. Um, th those are kind of the, the, the two things top of mind for me, because again, I am long term bullish on Bitcoin. I hold some, but in the near term, it's really the market structure that I'm, I'm nervous about more than anything. And if something happens there, while it wouldn't impact my longer term view of Bitcoin, it could certainly impact the, the price action. And that wraps things up for our panel discussion. For more investing strategies, head over to thestreet.com. I'm Bob Lang, and thank you for watching The Evolution of Blockchain, How the Foundation of Crypto is Changing Fintech.